The judge knocked twice on the door before he opened it and stepped in. Shalom, family. His deep voice boomed through the empty, dim house. I still sat at the table with little Yaakov and pretended to listen to him as he told me about the time Monroe took him riding on his big white horse. Dog lay on the ground by my feet. Her big warm body rested against my leg. It was hard for me to focus on what the little fellow was saying because I couldn't get past the fact that Monroe was completely blind. So many questions raced through my mind and along with them guilt that was so strong it took my breath. How long had he been blind? Why did it happen? I should have been there for him. Did he have to go through it alone? Had he been afraid? The judge stopped and looked into the big front parlor with the fireplace, the room where Monroe had gone and not come back. Hey, Ak, Toda for looking out for my little man for me. He stood there for a minute. And when he didn't get a response, a look of sadness came over his face. Sighing, he shook his head slightly before turning to head our way in the kitchen. When he saw us sitting at the table, his sadness was replaced with a smile. This handsome Hebrew man was not a warrior. He spoke too well, had way too much charisma. In my experience, most warriors were recluses they surrounded themselves with very few people. Not this man. This man was a people's person. He kind of reminded me of a politician. The kind of guy that could speak to anyone. Hey, how long he been like that? He nodded his head toward the living room. I frowned completely in the dark of what he was talking about. I don't know what you mean, I told him. He sighed again as he helped Yaakov clean up from his dinner. He sits in that chair and just stare at the fire. For the life of me, I don't know where he goes. He disappears somewhere in his head, I guess. He stopped for a moment and looked up at me. You know, I'm glad you're here. He needs someone tough like you. Someone that won't let him escape his reality. You asked me earlier why I let him babysit Yaakov. The answer is simple. For some strange reason, my son is the only one the blind swordsman will let in. And I don't know why, but he shuts everybody else out. Maybe you will be the one to break down the walls he's built around himself. He smiled at me, although it didn't reach his eyes, before holding out his hand. In all the chaos, we haven't formally met. My name is Malachi. I shook his hand. Anataya, how's my sister? Better than you. She's soaking in a nice hot bath with bubbles up to her ears. My mouth dropped. A bubble bath, I whispered. Oh dear Yah, what I wouldn't do for a bubble bath. He nodded his head before looking down at his son. You ready to go, buddy? Yaakov shook his head no. Malachi Ephraim, why not? Cause the pretty lady don't want me. My gaze flew down to him. The pain in his little voice so real. Do you mean Gina? I asked. I don't know her name, he muttered, looking down at his folded hands on the table. His father nodded. Cain, Yako. Her name is Gina. The little fella nodded before looking up at me with sad eyes. Yeah, Gina, he said. I rubbed his head. It's not that Gina doesn't want you, sweetheart. She's just afraid. His eyes widened. Afraid of what? I smiled. Well, this is her first time being away from her big sister. I put my hand on my chest. I have taken care of her for a very long time. And now it's you and your daddy's turn to take care of her for a little while for me. So you have to go and make her feel welcome so that she won't be afraid anymore. Can you do that? His little face brightened, and he nodded and Oh yeah, I can do that. He jumped up from the table and sprinted towards the door. 
Bye, Monroe. I'll see you tomorrow. He yelled in the living room without stopping on his way out the front door. His father looked at me. Thank you. I waved at him. Just take care of my sister. He smiled. I will. You have my word. He turned to follow his son, but then he paused and turned back around to look at me. Yahuwah showed me Monroe about a year ago before he washed up on these shores in a small boat nearly dead. At the time, at the time we were barely keeping the enemy out. He shook his head. None of us were warriors and we lost a lot of men. And then Monroe showed up. He chuckled dryly. I thought, after all these years y'all had been talking to me, showing me things, I had finally got a false vision. Because surely the blind old man that was nearly dead in the boat couldn't be the one he was sending to protect this land. He shook his head. So we dragged him up to this house. It took a bunch of us to carry him too. Dead weight? That sucker is heavy. Why this house, I asked. He shrugged. It was the one I had been told was for him. But like I said, at the time, I thought I had been led astray by that vision. So you can imagine my surprise when he regained his full strength and I learned that he was actually a young man under all that white hair and the best warrior I had ever seen. His blood lust was astonishing. Within a week, he had completely cleared away the enemy. We were burying bodies by the hundreds as to not attract any blood fiends. I had never seen anything like it, him being just one man. And then, when there was nobody else to kill, he sat in that chair staring at the fire and just checked out. And the only time he checks back in is when it's time to train the men or for some strange reason when Yaakov comes over. I have never seen anything like the pain that's reflected in his white gaze when he withdraws. Like I said, I don't know where he goes, but it's got to be a torturous place. I have prayed to Yahuwah that he sends that brother peace. Peace before his words faltered and he stared off into the distance. It was too soon for me to know if the judge's visions came from Yah, but it was something about him that reminded me of my father's mentor, the preacher, only younger. Okay, now granted, they did appear to be about the same age. But my daddy said that the preacher has had the same appearance since he first met him at a young man. He didn't seem to age. Although, it's been many years since the last time I saw him. Anyway, there was something about Malachi that really put me in the mind of him. Before what? I gently urged him to keep talking. He looked back at me, but his gaze was still distant. There is a storm coming, sis. Yahuwah's wrath is right upon the shore. There will be days like none the world has ever seen before. The journey ahead of us is one fraught with peril. And I, I pray that Yahuwah sent him peace before that journey. He blinked coming out of his thoughts. Sis, I saw you in my vision, and I have a message for you. You must learn how to be unselfish and give completely of yourself. And in doing that, you will bring peace to a raging storm. And then he turned and left, following his son out the front door, closing it gently behind him. I sat there at the table thinking over his cryptic message, lowering my hand to Scratch Dog's head, taking comfort in her soft fur. Be unselfish, she had said. Give completely of myself. I had no idea what he was talking about. I was the least selfish person I knew. 
Everything I did, I did for somebody else. Bring peace to a raging storm? Surely he didn't think that I could stop Yah's wrath. Is that the storm he's speaking of? I inhaled, looking around the damn kitchen that was lit by a beautiful Spanish-style light fixture that hung from the ceiling over the island. But where it was a place for several light bulbs, there was only one. And I could imagine one had to preserve things like light bulbs. Although, I wonder how this little town hidden in these mountains received electricity. I didn't see any solar panels on the houses stores or the city hall and electric companies were a thing of the past they were the first thing to go down when the flare hit so they couldn't be receiving power from that avenue i inhale <laughs> i am so stalling right now i couldn't avoid my role forever i needed to find out what his plans were for me come on ty you can do this Slowly I stood. Doll came to her feet next to me. As we walked toward the front parlor, one of the big wolves came out and stretched out in front of the front door. I frowned at him, wondering if he was the same wolf that stretched out in front of the door earlier. He was obviously trying to send me a message. My steps slowed when we reached the parlor. Monroe sat slouched down in a big chair facing the fire. His long, powerful legs were stretched out in front of him. His muscled arms were draped over the high arms of the chair. He stared in the fire without blinking. On the floor next to his legs sat the same wolf that had not left his side since I've been here. And I know it's the same wolf because he's the only one that wasn't all white. He had two black streaks behind each one of his ears. His big head rested against his paws, and he too stared into the fire without blinking. Slowly I approached him. Neither of them showed any signs of knowing I was in the room. I stood with my back against the wall next to the fireplace facing him. He didn't blink. There was not one eyebrow twitch, nothing to show that he knew I was here. I slid down the wall, sitting with my knees drawn up to my chest, hugging them close as I studied him. He stared at the fire with his all-white gaze, as if his body was a shell and everything that made him Monroe had checked out and traveled to a time in his past. I wondered where he was. Dog came to rest next to me. I rubbed her soft fur as I took him in. He had changed so much since I last saw him. I mean, don't get me wrong, Monroe was a wild boy. But with his long hair all over his head and his beard a mangled mess on his face, he looked savage. My gaze fell to his big tan hands. His knuckles were covered in bruises. Underneath his fingernails were clean, so that's a good sign. At least I know he bathed, although it didn't look like he did much else. His clothes were fairly clean, fairly. I wondered what he was thinking about as he stared into that fire. There was times I used to sit transfixed and listen as he shared his thoughts with me. He saw the world differently from everybody else I knew. I used to take the things he told me and turn them into song. Smiling, I thought about a time when we were kids. I had to be like 14 or 15. I think that maybe he was 18 or 19. Anyway, I wrote a song called The Essence of Life. And I'll never forget how they came to be. My dad had put me on punishment because I had gone into Dawid's room and I found his stash. And I borrowed a few bucks so that Gina and Yaya and I can go to the store. And Dawid got so mad at me because he was saving his money for something or another. And he told my dad. I tried to plead my case. I was just borrowing it. I would pay him back. It was just $20. 
But no matter what I said, it was no go. My dad was like, nah, you're on punishment. Okay, so yeah, now that I'm grown looking back, I so deserve that. But Dawid was no angel, and he had borrowed plenty of stuff from me. It's just that when I tried to run and tell on him, he would grab me and tie me up or something like that until I promised I wouldn't tell. Anyway, I digress. So I'm in the room crying because I think it's not fair. I'm the only one who ever get in trouble around here. Guinea being the youngest never got in trouble. And Dawid being the oldest got away with murder. Not me though. The hammer always seemed to come down on my head. And my room was toward the back of the house, right over Mama's greenhouse. I could look out my window and down into her patio garden. So I often left my window open for two reasons. One, I loved the smell of my Mama's herbs and flowers. And the second reason was, I never knew when Monroe would come for a visit. So I'm up there feeling sorry for myself when I catch a flash of white out of the side of my eye. I looked towards my open window just in time to see Monroe's head pop up. And he had this goofy grin on his handsome face. Secretly, I was waiting on him. Cause he always came to me when I was hurt or sad or angry <laughs> or even happy for that matter. You wanna go outside? He asked. I folded my arms. I can't. That wee big mouth butt told on me and my dad put me on punishment. Monroe hauls his body up, and as agile as King hops into my window. Come on, I want to show you something. I looked up at him confused, but I can't leave the house. Your pops just left with my pops, and Dawi at Benayas, he said, reaching for me. I could have guessed Dawi was gone, or else Monroe would not have attempted to come through my window during the day. But I didn't know my dad had left. Monroe pulled me to my feet from where I sat on the floor in front of my bed. Turning, he squatted down in front of me. Get, get on my back. I didn't think twice. I climbed on his back, wrapping my arms around his strong neck. And I remember having to force myself not to cry out when he climbed back out the window and did that Superman thing to the roof. As he put me on my feet, I looked around surprised because I had never been on the roof of the gym before. It pretty much was empty, except for a few items that had Monroe's name all over them. Back then, he drank chocolate milk like it was nobody's business, and there were several empty cartons, along with some balled up pieces of paper from where he was probably writing rap lyrics on the ground. Obviously, this was a spot he visited often. He took my hand and led me to the edge that looked out over the ghetto. Then he picked me up and set me on the ledge. I almost had a heart attack. I did cry out then, grabbing his arms in a death grip. Shh, relax. I got you. I won't let you fall. I'll never let you fall. Just sit and look out at the world. He stood behind me with his strong arms wrapped around my waist. His chin rested on my shoulder as he looked out ahead of us. And after my heart regulated a bit and the fear of falling to the ground and splattering all over it passed, I sat with my legs dangling over the side and I looked out at my hood. The setting sun casted a warm glow over everything, giving off the feel that the day was winding down and soon it would be time to rest for the evening. There was an abandoned storefront building across the street down the way a liquor store. Several of the neighborhood drunks sat out front on a few dirty crates. The smell of Uncle Remo's chicken and ribs floated from around the corner, filling the air. For a while, we sat in silence, and then he began to speak. There is an energy that flow through everything and everybody. He pointed at a woman who stepped off the bus. She was dressed in a work uniform, and she walked as if she was tired. Maybe she was just getting off work. It's flowing through her arms and her legs, up her neck and her face. He gently traced a pattern up my neck and cheek. It's supplying power to her cells, giving them life. 
Its passageway is through her veins. It flows through the heart, keeping it beating, but it collects up here. He gently touched my head. This is its home. But it's not just in people. I can see it everywhere. It's in the bricks of the building across the street. It's even in the blades of grass and the flowers. It's in the bees, even in the ants. It's in the rays of the sun. It's in a glass of water. He pointed at a dead bug that lay next to us on the ledge. When their force goes, something very ugly takes its place. It destroys, it breaks down. It's the reason leaves turn brown. He flicked the bug, sending it falling over the side. Once I saw a dog die. And as long as that force was in him, that light, he breathed. And then it left. It came out of his mouth and disappeared in the sky. Instantly, that dog was consumed with something so awful. I won't ever talk to you about it. The last he said in my ear, and his mustache tickled me, causing me to giggle a bit. He held me tighter. I realized that that force, that light, is life. It's in everything and everybody. But the word life doesn't sum up that energy as a whole. I turned my head to face him. What word does? He shook his head slightly. There is no word in this world that can sum it up. But we were given a name that will do for now, I guess. Yeah, that force, that life, that energy is Yah. He is of all, in all. There is nothing that can exist in this place without him. Nothing. Earth and its seed is of Yah. He's the, he paused searching his mind for the right word. He's the essence of everything in existence. And there are no letters, there are no letters in any language created that can sum him up. He's, he's the beginning and the end. Without him, there is no beginning. Without him is the end. I turned to look back out at the ghetto, seeing it through my rose eyes. He rested his chin back on my shoulder. Sing for me, baby. Sing for me so that I can see the world the way that you do. He whispered gently in my ear. And for a moment, I marveled that he had spoken the same words I had just thought about him. And then I sang for him. That night, I stayed up late, putting his words about that life force that I couldn't get out of my head in song dog moved next to me bringing me back to the present. I chuckled a bit. Monroe stared in the fire lost in his thoughts and I stared at him lost in mine. What a pair we made. For the life of me I didn't know what to say to him. Did he know I was here or was he so lost in his mind that he had no clue? Monroe I said gently. He didn't budge not even an inch. Even the wolf, who, for the first time I noticed, had eyes like Monroe's. They were all white. Even he had not moved. He didn't twitch an ear or anything. I frowned. Was his eyes like that when I first saw him? Monroe, I called a little louder. Nothing. My eyes slowly ran up his strong body, looking for even the hint of movement. And then a thought came to me. The day he first heard me sing, he said that that was his first time seeing color. And the only time he could see color after that is when I sang. So maybe if I sang to him now, maybe he could see. Thrilled, I opened my mouth and I began to sing a song I wrote last year. But I hadn't got but a few words out of my mouth before a miracle happened. 
the white film cleared from over his eyes and the wolf's. And for just a moment, his eyes looked away. I remembered dark brown with the white specks. He jumped as if burned. Before just a second, his gaze widened as he stared at the flame. He yelled out, slamming his eyes closed, scrambling out the chair so fast it toppled over. The wolf howled and jumped away from the fire. I stared, confused, as Monroe grabbed his eyes as if in pain. Shut up, he yelled. I snapped my lips shut. Stop singing! When he opened his eyes, the white film was back. His gaze fell on me. Don't ever sing to me again, he growled before he turned and stormed out the house, slamming the door behind him. For a moment, I stared after him shocked. He saw, he saw the fire. Before he had slammed his eyes shut, he stared at it for a moment in wonder. But it had upset him and I couldn't understand why. He told me never to sing for him again. What did that mean? I, I always sang for him. I sat there for a moment confused. The sound of a horse's cry filled the night. I got up and I went to the huge window that faced the ocean and the sight that greeted me was breathtaking. Monroe galloped fast down the beach on top of a beautiful white horse. Four of the big wolves raced at his side. In front of it, as if it was leading him, ran the wolf with the two black streaks behind his ears. His mighty paws ate up the sand, and he seemed to fly over the turf. Together, they made an outer-worldly picture. My fingers twitched for my songbird. I needed to play now. My emotions were a wreck, and I felt so lost. Turning away from the window, I crossed the big parlor. Right then, Mr. Guard Wolf came out and stretched back out in front of the door. Okay, I get it, I can't leave, I yelled at him. Dog began to whine in her throat as she butted her big head against my legs. What? Talk to your boy, he the one is tripping, I told her, gesturing toward the overachieving wolf. After giving him one last glare, in which he had the nerve to raise his ears, I marched up the stairs to get my songbird where Monroe had tossed her. But Dog continued on up. Dog, we can't go up there. She turned back to look at me, as if to tell me, stop being a chicken and come on. I don't know about this, I told her as I slowly followed, putting songbird on my back. I mean, I was curious to see how the rest of the house looked. And since Mr. Guard Wolf down there has made the message clear that I won't be leaving, I might as well look around, right? Right. The second level was big and just as empty as the first. There were about five bedrooms on this level. I opened the first door and peeped in. Empty. In fact, most of the rooms were completely empty, except for two. The first occupied bare room I came to was big and almost as empty as the first three. The only thing on the floor was a bedroll. There were a small pile of men's clothing folded neatly in the corner. In the closet hung the coat Monroe had on earlier. There was nothing else there. I smiled. Monroe has always had very simple tastes. And for such a beautiful boy, you would think he spent mad hours fussing over his clothes and outer appearance. Nah, not him. He was gorgeous without even trying. Well, at least he used to be. I had no idea what he looked like underneath all that hair. I wondered what happened to his beard. It used to grow in black. He was so handsome. And of course, I wasn't the only girl that thought so. Chicken heads used to come looking for Monroe from all over. My daddy said that boy had an insatiable appetite for woman flesh. It was one of the reasons why it irritated him every time he saw Monroe talking to me. I chuckled. Poor daddy. 
If Gideon wasn't one of his best friends, I know he would have made my road disappear a long time ago. In Helen, I turned and left out of his room, shutting the door behind me. Then I went to the last room at the end of the hall. I opened the door and sucked in my breath, surprised at what greeted me. The moon cast a soft glow on a beautiful bedroom. Unlike Monroe's room, this one had a plush mattress like cushion on the floor. It was made up very neat with sky blue sheets. My favorite color. There was a sky blue rug in front of it. I turned on the lights and cried out because the room was simply beautiful. The walls were a soft cream color and delicately etched in the paint was golden music notes. Oh my goodness, it was so lovely. I sat down on the floor and I pulled Songbird from behind my back and I began to play the notes that were there on the wall. It was Al Green's Simply Beautiful. Tears came to my eyes as I played. Monroe used to sing this song to me sometime. His singing was horrible, but it was something about the way he used to do it that will always break me down on the inside. And I never understood what motivated him to start singing either. He could be in the middle of a workout and I would come into the gym and he would stop dead in his tracks and just start singing it to me. And of course it would drive my daddy insane. And then there will be times when he will be talking to some girl, trying to convince her to sleep with him, I'm sure. And I will come around. And of course, I, you know, I'll be trying to ignore him, pretending I didn't care that he was flirting with another girl. But I would feel him watching me. And then he'd either start humming Simply Beautiful or singing it real low. And when I turn and look at him, he'd be staring at me with those strange eyes of his. And of course, whichever girl he was talking to at the time would get mad. But he didn't care. I mean, everybody knew Monroe was going to do whatever he wanted to do, when he wanted to do it, and he didn't care what nobody thought about it either. I shook my head. He was such a crazy boy. I think that's one of the main reasons why all the girls were so attracted to him. My fingers stilled as I stared at those golden music notes. There was something else about this design that was very familiar. Where had I seen this before? Oh dear Yah! This was the way I wanted to paint my bedroom when I was 17. I saw a picture in a magazine. It was an article about my favorite singer. She had gotten this special paint that had real gold flecks in it and painted these delicate notes on her bedroom wall. And she said that every morning when the sunlight hit it, the note seemed to come alive and she would begin each day just laying there as different notes lit up playing her a new tune each morning. I fell in love with the design instantly and I went to my mom. You see, she was more than likely to say yes than my dad. He pretty much said no about everything. However, when my mom seen the price tag of the paint, she shut down. No, Ty, are, are you crazy? You know your dad ain't gonna spend that kind of money on no gold paint. Why can't you get regular paint? Because, ma, when the sun touches the notes in the morning, it makes them come alive. And only that kind of paint do that. Do you know how perfect it would be for me to wake up every morning with music notes coming to life on my wall? She put her hand on her hip. Now, when they come to life, do they jump off the wall and go to somebody's job? Because that's the only way your daddy gonna agree to buy paint made out of real gold. Mom, come on, please. He'll do it. He'll do it if you say you want to see it done. With a grin on her face, she shook her head. Yeah, but I don't want to see it done, so no. Oh, I was so frustrated. I bugged my mother all week trying to wear her down, but it was a no-go. I even asked her if I can get a job to buy the paint myself. Child, you know your daddy ain't trying to hear that. That's not fair. I'm 17. 
And what that mean, a lion? She asked, giving me the look that said, wah, wah. And I already knew. My daddy, he wasn't trying to let me get a job. He barely let me and Guinea out his sight. Now, Dawid, Dawid did whatever he want. He came in whenever he want. He went wherever he want. It just wasn't fair. That night, while everybody else was in the gym, I stayed upstairs having me a pity party. Monroe somehow managed to slip past my dad and my brother and, and made his way upstairs. I was in the kitchen making myself a burger and some fries. Why are you not downstairs? He asked before he reached over my shoulder and stole one of my fries. I slapped his hand. Cuz, my family make me sick. Mm, 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 mm. Dear y'all, those words hurt so bad now. Why did I say something so stupid? Had I known that I would one day lose my whole family, I would have never said anything like that about them. I was a real dumb and selfish kid. Anyway, Monroe laughed and took a seat at my table. I turned my head back and looked at him. Um, I don't know why you getting comfortable. You know what my daddy say he gonna do to you the next time he catch you up here alone with me? He shook his head. Girl, ain't nobody scared of your daddy. He told me this in Spanish. I laughed at him, cause the only time he talked in Spanish is when he didn't want lying to understand what he was saying. I sat down at the table with my burger and fries. And after blessing my food, I began to eat. He looked over at me as if I had grown a tree root out of my head. What, I asked as I took a huge, ignorant bite out of my burger. How you just gonna sit down in front of your man like that and not put a plate in front of me? That made me laugh real hard. I know butter didn't raise you better than that, he continued. All she do is feed lion. That's why his stomach hanging over his belt buckle down. I nearly choked laughing at him. Monroe was so retarded. First of all, I told him, my daddy belly ain't hanging over his pants. And second of all, you ain't my man. You Peach's man, and Kim's man, and Lorraine's. You is a whore. Now, if my man was here, I would make him some food. The smile left his face. Your man here though? I looked around him. Where? Is he downstairs? All the amusement left his face. You gonna keep playing with me and get somebody killed. Now, at the time I didn't know just how serious he was. Please Monroe, you ain't got a faithful bone in your body. I keep telling you, I ain't trying to be with no man like that. You ought to be ashamed of yourself cause you living bogus brother. And I keep telling you that as soon as you agree to marry me, I will hang it all up. To you, I'll be true. I held my lips to the side in a way that said I didn't believe him. My mama say a zebra can't change their stripes. And it ain't a day that go by that my daddy don't warn me about him and his whorish ways. Heck, how many times have I heard Gideon threaten him with death if he got one of these little girls pregnant? He reached across the table, wrapping his big hand around mine. I tried to pull it away from him, but he didn't let me go. I don't know why you find it so hard to face the fact that when y'all made me, he made you for me. You my rib, girl. Plus, don't nobody know how to make you smile like I do. Can't nobody make you happy like me. Without me, you'll never feel fulfilled. As he talked, I thought to myself, yeah, but can't nobody make me cry like him either. How many times I had to just sit there and pretend that my heart wasn't shredded in pieces as he flirted with some girl or had to watch while some chick who couldn't face the fact that he was done with her stalked him, slid his tires, busted out his car windows. His dad said that was his punishment for him sinning the way he did, sleeping with all those girls. You already mine, he continued. You just don't know it. Nah, what I didn't know was why the boy wouldn't leave me be. Why he couldn't just let us be friends. I loved him with all my heart and soul. He was my best friend. Why did he insist on pulling me into his madness? He kept playing these head games with me and I wanted to be free of it. One day, I'm gonna be all you got, he said, looking at me with those intense eyes of his. 
and I'm going to supply everything you need and most of the stuff you want, including painting our bedroom with that crazy ass expensive paint you just got to have. But it's going to be a room in my house, not your daddy's. One day you're going to depend only on me and you're going to love only me and I'm going to make you the happiest lady in all the world. I shake my head at him, not believing him in the least. You see, Monroe had a smooth tongue. Dawi liked to joke with him saying he could talk a nun out of her drawers. And as if to prove his point, he began to sing Simply Beautiful to me. I tried to pull my hand out of his to cover my ears, but he didn't let me go. In fact, he stood pulling me out of my chair and into his arms. I pushed at him trying to get free. But he only lifted me closer, burying his head in my neck. Oh my goodness, stop, you sound horrible, I cried. And he did too. But the truth was, just like every time he sung this song to me, he was breaking me down. Especially when he got to the part of the song that said, Because that was the part of the song I know he meant. There was never a time I needed him and he was not there for me. He had been cradling me in his arms, soothing away my pain since I was a little girl. I could depend on him that way. It was trusting him with my heart that was dangerous. And no matter how much I wanted to, I couldn't believe him when he said he wanted only me. I leaned songbird against the plush floor cushion and stood, looking at the beautiful walls. I was speechless. He remembered. He remembered the paint I wanted when I was 17. I didn't know what to do with that information. I, I didn't know what to say. How did he even find it with the world and the condition it was in? I was taken aback by his act. You see, I didn't think the same way I did when I was a girl. Life had gotten real. And one day we lost everything that we had known as home. Our mama, our daddy, the gym. For the last 10 years, I've been surrounded by cutthroat snakes, losing sleep to keep my sister safe. The world had become a very cold place to live in. I can't remember the last time somebody did something so kind for me. In fact, if I was being honest with myself, there had never been nobody, I mean, outside my parents, of course, who did things for me like Monroe. Just take this room, for example. It's the only room in the whole house that was decorated. It even had its own bathroom. When I flicked on the light, an immense rush of pleasure washed over me when I saw how beautiful it was. Slowly, I walked to the lovely marble sink. On top of it was a few essentials, a comb and brush, a brand new toothbrush still in the box, a tube of toothpaste. I picked up a bottle and read it. Dear ya, it was shampoo. And not just any kind of shampoo, herbal essence, my favorite. There was also a new bar of homemade soap. I picked it up and sniffed it, closing my eyes. It was my favorite fragrance, grapefruit. He remembered all my favorites. I didn't even think he paid attention. Tears came to my eyes as once again an overwhelming rush of guilt washed over me. Quickly, I shut the bathroom door. Dog sat on her hind legs in the middle of the floor and watched as I ran a bath. I wasn't gonna cry, I told myself as I took off my clothes. I wasn't going to cry, I told myself as I stepped in the hot bath. I wasn't going to cry, I promised myself as I eased down into that bathtub. It had been 10 years since I soaked in a tub of hot water and had my husband that I shunned, I lied on and I hurt beyond belief not come looking for me. 
I probably would have missed out on this blessing as well. I put my face in my hand and I cried my heart out. 